How do you redesign your organization so that it enables this to be the default way of working is really, really important. In that old mindset, you only look at it through the filter of, does it help me do my job? And if it does, you use it. And if it doesn't, you discount it. And the team of teams mindset is always open to, does it help the team do the job? Does it help for us Team TCS, the Children's Society do the job? Not does it just help me with my individual agenda? In each case, we delivered really great integrated work, but actually the experience of it, and therefore how that informed the success of it, and how the lessons from it informed the next time, um, we feel we've got a much more profound way of rethinking how we do things, so that we can do it quicker, smarter, more effective, um, better results, but also more motivating for people so that they don't drop after it, feeling that there was too great a cost for the results that we've achieved. Hello Brave Fundraisers, this is Rob and welcome back to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is episode 148. This is the podcast for fundraisers who want ideas and maybe a little dose of inspiration to help you raise more money and really enjoy your job. In today's episode, we're again looking at the difficult but crucial topic of silo busting and ways to create a culture where everyone pulls together rather than get in each other's way. Just before we get into the content this week, I wanted to say a very quick thank you and shout out to some people who've been helping to spread the word and get in touch and let me know how helpful this show has been uh, because it makes such a difference to me making these episodes to know that it's making a difference. So to Catherine in the UK and also to Hayley, to Millie in New Zealand and Simone in Australia, to long-standing friends of the show Max, Emily and Anna, and also to Sasha Kamenetsky and Ruth Dean, who posted recently that they've been finding my book helpful. Thank you to you guys and to everybody else who shares this show with colleagues or on social media or who gets in touch to let me know that it's making a difference. It really does help me ever so much as I keep plugging away, putting these episodes together. And as for today's show, I'm going to share the second half of my recent interview with the brilliant Joe Jenkins who's a very experienced charity leader. Last time, he talked us through an example of a shift in approach and culture at Friends of the Earth, where he once worked, and how it dramatically reduced misunderstandings between teams, and how it led to an amazing surge in creativity, action-taking, and truly spectacular results. One thing we talked about was the excellent book, Team of Teams, and two concepts that the author, General McChrystal, has found are vital to nurture if you're serious about being effective in the fast-moving, complex world we live in now. Those two invaluable behaviours to encourage are shared consciousness, in the sense of things that everyone can ongoingly do to have an understanding of and care about what all the different teams are trying to achieve, and empowered execution, in the sense of people feeling encouraged to make decisions themselves as much as possible, rather than slow it down and pass things up the chain of command. If you haven't already done so, I'd really recommend you listen to part one with Joe, which is episode 147. And in today's show, the second half of our chat, Joe shares what he's learned as a leader and a fundraiser about how to apply these ideas in the context of the charity he works at now, the Children's Society, using examples and practical tips that anyone can apply, whether or not you are currently in a leadership role. I really enjoyed this chat with Joe, and I hope that you do too. I would love it to tune in to some practical things. I think it is so important to start with that bigger picture rationale and understanding of just what we're up against and to know that according to lots of research and good practice now, effective practice, shared consciousness and empowered execution are really important things for leaders to be trying to achieve and everybody in an organisation to try and achieve. Practically speaking, what are some of the things you've learned either at Friends of the Earth or at your current organisation or the, where you, there's other organisations you admire, tactics that follow through on helping those two things happen? Yeah. So probably worth saying, as I moved into the Children's Society, it, I was really brought in with that brief to look at um, how can we apply some of what you've learned from Friends of the Earth to our organisation. And in my mind, probably two things that I really wanted to, to do in doing that. Um, so one was that there were lessons that I learned from that time at Friends of the Earth that uh, I wanted to apply 
in the next kind of iteration. But also one of the things I heard a lot when I was having conversations at the time was that sounds great, but it's easy at an organization like Friends of the Earth, isn't it? You're a campaigning organization. Um, you're not that, you know, you've only been around for 40 years. You don't have all the baggage of, you know, kind of historic organizations. You don't deliver services. We were around 150 people. Um, you know, try doing that if you have a much bigger workforce and so on. So I guess I wanted to test the concept in a different environment. And the Children's Society is a very different environment to Friends of the Earth. Yeah, we're, we're a Victorian charity. We were founded in 1881. So we've got over 140 years of heritage. We have far more conservative roots being built out of a partnership with the Church of England and having a largely faith-based supporter base. We're over 800 people. We have sort of 80 to 100 services all around the country, many of which are contracted with local authorities. And so I wanted to see whether it was possible to take those ideas and apply them in a much more of a kind of Victorian institution than, you know, a kind of a campaigning network, which is what Friends of the Earth was. And applying both of those at the Children's Society. One of the things I realised at Friends of the Earth was that we had that success with bees. But actually, whilst it sustained around the bee activity, it didn't become the whole default way of working for the organization. So some practices still sprung back into place. And so I wanted to look at how do you make sure that actually it does become a default way of working? It's not just, again, because of the leadership at the time and because we had a particular activity that lent itself to it. Um, and so I think uh, for anyone uh, sort of serious about embedding this kind of mindset, taking a hard look at how do you redesign your organization so that it enables this to be the default way of working is really, really important. But also um, at Friends of the Earth, I don't think we got the balance right between the shared consciousness and the empowered execution. I think we overly focused on empowered execution. So we really, really wanted to push creativity and decision making. And as a consequence, I don't think it held together as well internally as it might have appeared externally. And so there's a real need to respect both of those things and put the same effort into both of those things. So I described at the start, my role is, is social impact. So there's a lot more I could say and won't now, but we, we have looked at redesigning quite radically how we operate so that we've moved away from structurally having departments, functions, teams, to having a much more agile operating model in which um, we build up communities of practice around knowledge sets, but actually the work is all done in activity. And the sort of default way of working is starting with what's the outcomes, what's the objectives, what skill do you need to deliver it, as opposed to this is the team and the team plan, what activity should we deliver within our team. Um, and we've put a lot of effort into constantly coming back to what's the outcome, what's the purpose, what's the story, what is it that we're trying to do around each activity. Now, it's difficult, and I think I really want anyone listening um, to, to both know it's difficult and and that's okay, um, because actually the reason why it's important is because it's really, really difficult working in silos all the time, and it frustrates everybody, and it wastes our time, and it wastes our effort, and we don't have the impact that we're here to achieve. Um, but that doesn't mean setting yourself up in this way is easy because we've got so much heritage and baggage that we're all trying to work with all the time because we're all used to working in organizations that are bureaucratic hierarchies where everyone's siloed and so that's our reference point and it's and every time a new person starts they come from another organization that works in that way and so it's a constant journey to sort of reiterate but it means then as a leader that you have to be comfortable saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again um, and just when you're really really fed up with it and you think I'm ridiculous for saying the same thing that's probably when someone's just clicked um, and I know I've been at the Children's Society now for eight years and in the last week uh, I've had a conversation with somebody who went I just got that I just suddenly understood what that meant because it was the you know the hundred of time order but it was the moment where their day-to-day -day reality clicked with with the message when they suddenly saw okay if i share that with that person then actually that enables them to do that and if i put that update here um, even though it doesn't serve my purpose it suddenly enables somebody else to to do something else so i think that kind of need um to constantly reconnect tell the same story over and over again and uh, recognize that it is inherently difficult and that's okay um, uh, is, is an important part of sort of building your own resilience to carry that through but also the resilience of people around you who can kind of keep faith because we can see the value of it but alongside that I think 
playing back the quick wins, playing back the, the benefits, reminding each other of what we're able to achieve that we wouldn't have been able to achieve before all becomes really important to that as well. Yeah. So could you zoom in on some of what that looks like, either mm. in terms of one of those agile teams or, for instance, in terms of the frequency with which, as McChrystal suggests, more people need to be proactively sharing what they're up to with other teams and listening to what other teams are up to as well. And anything else that helps people keep tuning into the common goal, mm. even if initially they say, well, why do I need to go to that meeting when my job was this? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. The, some of the practices are, can appear less efficient because I wanted to get on with my job today, Joe. <laughs> Could you help us tune into the kinds of things, habits that are more expected and more normal at the Children's Society now compared to what more orthodox charity setups would be doing? Yes. So, for example, we have a weekly email which goes to everyone in Social Impact, which everybody feeds into, which then kind of plays back um, updates and news and views and things that are going on. Um, uh, and that's one touch point of many where we're just trying to get into a rhythm of sharing what's going on so that people have a better understanding of what's going on in, in different bits of the organization um, and how it all relates back together again. So alongside that, we introduce something called Basecamp, which is a once a month gathering where we encourage everybody to work from the same space. Now, this has been increased in importance since we've embraced hybrid working and so on, where people aren't always in the same space at the same time in, to the frequency that they were before. But the idea again of Basecamp is to create space for people to have those casual interactions and do that informal storytelling with each other. But then on the base camp day, we have a campfire, which is a one hour uh, storytelling session. And so that's when we all gather together, both those who are there in person, and we make sure that those who are online can join in as well. And we use that time to share success stories and things that haven't worked that we've learned from and things that are coming up. And sometimes we might focus in on one thing. But we encourage everybody to use that as a space to kind of reconnect. And those are just a couple of examples of, you know, the sort of continual, um, every activity works in teams, in activity groups, where we have a, a, a sort of principle of working in the open. Documents are all transparent. Anyone can access them. We're asking people to routinely put information about what they're doing so that others can, can learn about it as well. So we have this kind of constant flow of sort of working in the open, transparent information sharing with points where we bring people together, both sort of electronically and in person, so that we have this sense of what's going on, why is it going on, how does it relate to us? And then our job as leaders is to keep reframing it so that we can contextualize all how these bits fit together. So we can do that sense making so that when we hear the updates, we can say, and this is how it fits with this outcome, and this is how it's related to this vision. So you have that kind of uh, sort of energized sense of people all feeling they have a voice and that they can share what's going on, but they can listen to what else is going on and they can see how it all fits together. Yeah. And I remember I just got a couple of vivid memories from McChrystal's book of where the old style of command and control, you know, you know your job, but you don't necessarily know what the higher up general's bigger plan for next week is. In the second half of the book, he, he talks of times where they catch the bad guys. They stop the bomb going off because two or three different people shared a part of the jigsaw, a part of the puzzle of little bits of data they'd picked up in Baghdad and someone else had, had heard uh, com coming from some other terrorist cell in a different country and so on. Any one of those jigsaw pieces in and of itself wasn't necessarily a red flag, but this proactively doing the slightly more time-consuming, laborious job of keep sharing your bit of the story over and over again, they started to, to notice, to join the dots, notice the pattern and get going and stop the bomb happening in a way that the old way, in a more predictable world, you just, you wouldn't have, and again and again on, uh, when there's public inquiries and when there's things happen in the news and that the story is always, we need to learn the lessons of this and different agencies need to talk to each other about what could have, you know, how this child's life could have been saved or why this police force didn't know that it, the intelligence about that other thing all over the place organizations don't routinely share team of teams see the pattern join the dots and be able to be effective and team of teams is as good a way as i've ever discovered of 
increasing your chances of of seeing the pattern and, and getting it and taking action. So I sense that that's a lot of the reason for going to this trouble. And I say trouble, actually, once you work this way, it's perfectly natural and it's probably a more enjoyable, connected way of working. But in the context of, for instance, communication, policy work, volunteering or fundraising, or even across fundraising, for the corporate fundraiser to share what their corporate partner has just said or done or is about to do, and for the major donor fundraiser or the legacy fundraiser to hear that bit of the story and put two and two together or the leaders kind of help necess- potentially curate how that fits into your next campaign and how it could be improved. I'm starting to see how it can help your organisation and all the bits of it become more effective. Exactly that. And um, just one example of that. Recently, there was um, a piece of research that another organisation had released around the shocking statistics around the rise in uh, waiting times for young people with mental health struggles. And it was something that had come across the desk of our news team and they had shared it with some uh, policy colleagues who had shared it in a wider group. Um, I spotted it and included it in a blog that I was writing within the organisation. And uh, one of my colleagues who uh, is working in business development was putting forward a bid and they were missing a crucial statistic and they found it in that piece of research. Um, And that was a definitive part of that bid then being successful and it's just simple things like that it's just the um, that bit of information that in that old mindset you only look at it through the filter of does it help me do my job and if it does you use it and if it doesn't you discount it and the team of teams mindset is always open to does it help the team do the job does it help for us team tcs the children's society do the job not does it just help me with my individual agenda so it's a different way of looking at and thinking about the way that we do our work because our default way of working is thinking about the organization's success as opposed to our individual success in our strategy we talk about it as being a a star organization even over star teams So in other words, of course, we want everybody to excel within the organization. But what we value the most is how we all contribute to something bigger than ourselves, rather than having hero teams and star players, um, but not actually all playing towards the same outcomes. And so embedding that default way of thinking, and that's another thing as leaders, what do you reward? What do you recognize? What do you celebrate? And so again, you know, I can feel quite, uh, you know, am I, am I doing it too much? Um, but I know me and my chief exec, my other exec colleagues, every time we celebrate something, you will see in that celebration something about the collective effort, how this is a great example of us working together. We are constantly looking for that um, uh, endorsement of joint and, and collaborative working. We'll never just say, well done you as an individual. We'll say, well done for working with others to make that happen. And when we see someone going out of their way um, to help somebody else with that success, um, you know, like in, in a game of football, you look at you know uh, who set up the goal, not just who scored it. Um, it's constantly looking for that kind of reinforcement. And that messaging is so, so important because it just seeps into the way that the organization thinks and behaves um, because you start to see what gets rewarded, what gets noticed around here, what is it that we think is us at our best. And that becomes a, a crucial part of making it work. Hey there, it's Rob. And I wanted to quickly let you know about our two flagship training programs. That's the Major Gifts Mastery Program and the Corporate Partnerships Mastery Program to give you a sense of the difference they can make. Here's a really quick bit of feedback we received recently from Asia Parekh, who took part in our most recent Corporate Mastery Programme. This is my first corporate fundraising position. I, I've never corporate fundraised before. I rely quite heavily on the things that Rob taught. Since being on the programme, the charity has managed to turn over 10 partnerships. We started off with one. While I was on the course with Rob, that one turned into six, and now it's turned into 10. For the charity, the partnerships are worth around £10,000 each. And at 10, we have a total of £100,000 coming in. I would really, really recommend the programme. Absolutely do it. It's worth every penny. And I'm really, really grateful for having been on it. To find out more about either Corporate Partnerships Mastery or the Major Gifts Mastery Programme, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. And if you have any questions, please do get in touch. It is interesting, isn't it? Because the most enlightened sports managers I hear on interview, they're so absolutely relentless in reinforcing that notion. However hard the journalist eggs them on to say Mm -hmm. what what a wonderful striker did today, 
the absolute the, the smartest ones absolutely a refuse and b i think it's not even needing willpower it's because they genuinely see it as a collective effort so they're not even actually on second thoughts having to try of course they value the hard work and skill of any given player but they know that the like there's all kinds of teams full of highly paid skillful professionals which are doing awfully the ones that truly thrive the the leaders relentlessly understand truly understand that if we're ever going to achieve high performance level it can only ever come because as a leader and all of the individuals are thinking team first i wonder if there's any other example that springs to mind for you joe that could give our listeners a sense of this in practice and the difference that this can make well if i think about um a similar activity that we've done three times with different versions of this operator model, it might give a sense of uh, how I see the difference. Because I'm sure in one sense, many will have examples in their organizations of integration when we've brought people together from different functions and teams on, on, a, on a common project to, to, to more or less uh, success. But if I think um, uh, sort of pre-pandemic back around 2019, Whilst we've begun to do a lot of work within the Children's Society to um, develop a, a, a shared strategy and a lot to join up around our kind of supporter engagement, we were still really organised around different functions. So we had a separate marketing department, a separate kind of external affairs campaigning department and a separate kind of fundraising supporter engagement. And we decided that we would um, organise um, a, a moment where we brought all of our efforts together. We call it the mental health moment um, during the summer. and um, uh, we sort of set up an integrated project where we had people from each of those different functions working together and it would involve lots of different activity that would have outcomes for both kind of marketing and brand fundraising campaigning and so on um, and at the time i had to step out the organization uh, just for uh, an operation and so i'd kind of been involved in some of that setup and then i was out for about four weeks and i came back and i'd seen some of it going on externally and we did some really great creative stuff some really bold and some innovative activity we created something called the Store of Modern Childhood, which was really quite an edgy PR event that had uh, a real life shop that was selling body armor to children. And, you know, so some really imaginative stuff that, that captured the public attention. Internally, it was absolute carnage. Um, the, the environment was as toxic as I've ever experienced in an organization. People were absolutely tearing themselves apart because although outwardly the activity had had more join up because we'd forced it internally it would have been at great cost um, and it took a long time to pick up the pieces after that and that was because we incentivized as many organizations do that whilst we're saying the aim is integration what we're actually doing is asking everybody to deliver on their own agenda. So everybody is tasked with their own objectives, which I sometimes describe a bit like the, the United Nations, the UN, where each country kind of sends its delegation into, into a convention. And they've all got their own red lines and their own wins, and they're going to, to win for their country. And that was really how these kind of integrated activities were set up. It's like campaigning. Of course, they were there, but they were like, this is what campaigning needs. And they ended up in huge battles with marketing who had huge battles with fundraising because all those objectives whilst each they could point towards the strategy um, were different they required different resources and different approaches so that was an example of us doing integration but doing it in, in that old model where you're setting people up against each other even when you say you're trying to collaborate in 2020 with the pandemic um, by this point we had brought those functions uh, into one directorate um, so I had inherited all those different functions together and so we now had one leadership team that were responsible in the, for those functions so we still had marketing fundraising campaigning but they now set in the same direction rather than different ones and so when the pandemic happened and we had the lockdown and so on um, uh, we determined that we would do an emergency appeal um, and that that would be the framing for all of our joint fundraising communications and campaigning efforts and so we set one one plan and uh, we set out to launch an appeal that would both uh, kind of respond to what was needed for children at that time, uh, what was needed for the organisation to respond to children at that time, and would serve our purposes around raising our brand, raising our funds, and also what political action was needed. 
And it was one of the most successful campaigns that we've had in our history. We absolutely smashed the target. We had set ourselves uh, to raise um, 5 million within a year, and we raised uh, about 7 million within six months. Um, So that starting from a different place, starting with a joint plan, and focusing everything on those outcomes and actually um, challenging ourselves to work in new ways. So, for example, we got uh, our first uh, emergency appeal. I remember really clearly I spoke to my colleagues um, on the Wednesday morning. Um, I went to the executive team in the Wednesday afternoon and we went live on the Friday. Now, typically, that would have been probably a 12 month project if we said we were going to launch an integrated campaign of this nature. But it was a one week project because it had to be, but because we were setting ourselves up in a different way. However, although all of that was achieved, we still reflected that um, it was still di- was more difficult than it needed to be because you still had those directors in that group representing their functions. Although working on a plan, they were accountable for what well, in this plan, I'm making sure that we bring a marketing perspective because I need to deliver on my marketing goals, as opposed to this is the outcome we need to achieve. What do we collectively need to achieve? And we can bring our different skills together. So although I think we did some really brilliant stuff there, actually, there were still some bruises. It was still uncomfortable. People were still a bit edgy with each other. It was better than it had been. And we were proud of the success, but it wasn't, it wasn't as smooth as it could be. Jump forward to 2022, um, and we are now operating in our new uh, social impact model where we no longer have directors responsible for departments. So the senior team around me have responsibility for shared outcomes. They're all responsible for brand as well as for fundraising, as well as for campaigning. They just bring different lenses to it. And we were responding to um, a significant concern around the cost of living crisis and how we could protect young people, particularly through some of the government budget decisions around the kind of Liz Trust time. There were some really big threats to the support that's available to children. And so we delivered an integrated campaign over six months that needed to respond and put pressure on the government to protect children, whilst also raising funds for the support we were providing to children and raised awareness and reframed how children were being seen in the context of the cost of living crisis. Only this time when we did it, um, rather than us saying we need marketing and fundraising, blah, 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 we said, okay, this is the campaign. This is the goal that we need to achieve. These are the targets that we need to achieve. And we brought people together with different skills at different times, depending on different bits of the activity and so on. Now, Really, really proud of that campaign. It supported, it enabled us to um, beat our Christmas fundraising targets. We secured the political outcomes that we were looking for. We safeguarded particularly child benefit and also additional um, local support for children as well. And we were able to raise more awareness and start to see our messaging reframed. And we had government insiders telling us it was our campaign that made the difference and so on. But probably most, not only did we achieve those things, but internally, Um, It was just how we did things. So I didn't have lots of battles with people saying, well, my team's not being represented and it's not fair because and no, 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 no. Um, actually everybody just found it a really positive way of working with each other. Now, of course, tactically, there are things we could have done better and all that kind of thing. But actually, in terms of how it felt, everybody kind of reported and felt proud of. And we did a lot of this is a joint effort. Isn't it brilliant how we're all working together and we're bringing the whole organization together. And the thing about that was, uh, as that continued, it just kept going. So it's like, right, what's the next wave of activity? What's the next wave of activity? Because it's a new way of doing things as opposed to just a one off where you bring people together for, for a project. And so for me, that's the kind of journey from in each case, we delivered really great integrated work, but actually the experience of it and therefore how that informed the success of it and how the lessons from it informed the next time, um, we feel we've got a much more profound way of rethinking how we do things so that we can do it quicker, smarter, more effective, um, better results, but also more motivating for people so that they don't drop after it, feeling that uh, it, there was too great a cost for the results that we've achieved. So, Joe, thank you for that example. Through those three iterations of attempting to adhere to these principles, I've got a really good sense of just what a difference it can make. The truth is, this is one of the hardest things I think any organisation, any leader can succeed at, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but it's, you know, it's not a quick win by next week. However, if our listeners have at some level been given food for thought and they're determined to to start this journey and or get some quick wins to move somewhat in this direction to get some of the benefits for their colleagues their supporters their donors 
for those that they serve. What are your thoughts, knowing what you know now on this interesting journey for how someone can try and make some progress? People sometimes ask me uh, about their career hopes. So people that are looking at their career journey and thinking, I'd like to be a director one day. Um, yeah, what, what, what's your advice? And uh, aside from asking people to think deeply about if that's really what they do want to do, um, I always say, um, start acting like you're a director. Like, don't wait until you get the job title. Start uh, from today um, showing up as a senior leader in your organization, because that will allow you to establish the practices that will enable you to be a really successful leader one day. And the organization will see that in you and you'll create more opportunities for yourself. And I say the same thing when people ask about how we can um, start to embed some of these principles in their organization is you don't need to wait. So, of course, what I've uh, set out today is that I do think fundamentally for a whole organization to embrace a model that is responsive to the challenge of the 21st century, that's a big strategic change that requires organizational leadership and commitment, and you're not going to do it overnight. Um, but to head in that direction, you don't need to wait for your chief executive to do a big announcement and set up a major change program. You can start living it today because actually many of the ways in which this way of working show up is in day to day behaviours. It's in the mindset you bring to the work you do in whatever role you're in, whether you're a manager or a leader or a leader in a different sense. So a leader within the organisation through the influence you have on others, which is ultimately what leadership is, is about how you influence, inspire others rather than what you do within your own day to day. And so what does that look like practically? It means making sure that you bring a mindset that you're here for the organization to succeed, not just to hit your own individual targets. So it's having a bigger than yourself mindset to the way that you work. It's continually challenging yourself to think, how does what I'm learning benefit others as well as myself? Is there something that I've heard today that if I share that with someone else, it could help them with the work that they're here to do? And not being afraid to share that information. So not being afraid to reach out to others and say, um, wondered if this was useful, drop it in an email, put it into Teams or Slack or whichever platforms you have available. Um, uh, I find um, actually, and I was doing this before and then the organization started doing it. We have something called Coffee Roulette where every month we match people randomly in the organization to have, uh, we say, um, have 15 minutes, 30 if you're up for it, have a coffee and have a chat. Um, and that's uh, and so having that practice every month of speaking to someone who's not in your day to day is incredibly valuable because they will learn things about your world that they didn't know and you'll learn things about theirs. And these are the kind of practices, sharing things, talking and thinking about what can I do to help you, not just what can you do to help me. And you can start to build this into your team's uh, work. You can start to think about when you're planning any activity, who else could we involve in this? And how can we make sure that we set some shared objectives from the start? And for me, that's one of the sort of big learning points is that uh, join up works best, not when you're mushing together your different objectives, but when you're agreeing some shared ones. So rather than saying, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, you say, here's what we could do together. And this is what we could both bring to it. That can be a big grand organizational strategy, or it could just be a bit of work that you're doing this week. It could be that you're doing a fundraising appeal and you think, well, maybe somebody else could be involved in working on the, the storytelling or I'll share the case study we're working on and see if someone else has got some feedback. Not because it's part of the sign off process, but because they might learn something from it and they might have a perspective that I wouldn't have caught. So I think the day to day habits and practices are actually what change culture and uh, approaches in organisations. If you are in a senior leadership position or in a position where you can directly influence strategy, then I would encourage you um, to think about how you might put this way of working into the mix and explore that with your colleagues. I'd recommend everyone listening to read Team of Teams because I do think there's something for everyone in there. And there's actually a follow-up book, uh, which I can never remember, but you'll you'll find it because it's the same authors, um, which has much more of a, uh, a practical breakdown of how they apply Team of Teams in practice down to how they run day, daily meetings and how they provide uh, different kinds of agendas and stuff like that. So there's lots of practical stuff in there that you could apply uh, in any way. But I would say don't wait for your organization to catch up and um, start to show the organization what's possible through the way that you show up every day in the organization. Lots of practical things we can get done, as well as thank you for just sharing your view of what good leadership is. And it's that think bigger, think more generous, think how you, you can serve what you can give, as well as your day job. 
which might be fundraising or policy or whatever, just reiterating that is, is super helpful. And then those several things that we can practically do on any given day. Super helpful as ever, Joe. I'm so grateful that you've made time at an especially busy time of year. I really, really do appreciate it. I wish you all the best with your continued efforts with your colleagues to make such a wonderful difference for children in this country. And I look forward to catching up with you another time to talk and learn some more. But for now, Joe Jenkins, thank you so much for sharing your ideas on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Rob. I hope you found our chat and Joe's tips helpful. I especially love the point he made about how each of us can choose to act like and practice being a certain kind of leader, whether or not it's our official role. If you found the episode encouraging and you think it would help other people too, please do me a favour and share it on with your team and with other charities. Thank you ever so much for your help. Now, if you've been enjoying this podcast and you'd like to go way deeper than is possible in these half hour shows, then one thing you could do is to check out my upcoming Wow Your Donors Masterclass, which is happening in person in London on the 5th of March, 2024. The idea behind the course is that, especially in a tough fundraising environment like the one we're in now, if you can do something different to what most donors would ever expect to make them feel some kind of wow moment, for instance, in how special they feel or a deeper insight or connection to the difference their donation makes, then over time, you will raise dramatically more money for your charity. This is one of my all time favorite topics and we spend a whole day sharing lots and lots of inspiring examples and dozens of practical techniques that you can use to create wow moments for your supporters. If this sounds interesting, follow the link in the episode notes or just go straight to our website at brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services and click on wow your donors. Finally, I know there's a strong chance you're already subscribed to the Fundraising Bright Spot show, but if you're not, please do hit that button now. You'll immediately be able to listen to part one of my chat with Joe about silo busting, as well as setting yourself up to receive all the juicy new shows we're releasing in the next few weeks. Do let us know what you think about today's one. On Twitter, Joe is at Mr. Joe Jenkins and I am at Woods underscore Rob and we're both on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for listening today and for supporting our show. Good luck with your fundraising and your leadership. And I can't wait to share more Bright Spot stories with you very soon.